Um, so I'm really excited about the talk today um, by Carol B. and Marcelo Fuentes. They're going to be talking about their, the work that they did that came out of their participation in the FLIGHT project. FLIGHT stands for Foreign Languages and the Literary and the Everyday. And it is a project that is being <coughs> undertaken by CORAL, which is our sister LRC at the University of Texas in Austin. And so um, Carol and Marcelo, who are both PhD candidates in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, are going to be sharing the outcomes of their work in that project. And the title of their talk is Incorporate, Incorporating the Literary and the Everyday in the Foreign Language Classroom. So please welcome our speakers. Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. Thank you for um, having us here. As Kate mentioned, uh, we had the opportunity to work on the flight project as choral collaborators in um, the University of Texas at, uh, at Austin. And as collaborators, we developed and published lessons based on this flight approach. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So before we get into the, the nitty gritty, um, just a quick overview of what the uh, agenda looks like for today. Uh, what, is the what is flight? Um, what's the importance of flight? And why the flight approach? What are the challenges that this uh, framework is addressing in foreign language teaching? And of course, the different concepts of, of the flight approach, which, in which include the literary and the everyday. Um, and then we'll see some examples of finding the literary in the everyday. Um, and some of the categories of making meaning in this construct. And then, of course, bringing in some examples um, from Spanish for intermediate level students. I apologize that we do not have uh, many examples from other languages. Marcelo and I are both from the Spanish and Portuguese department, and we develop these lessons for intermediate level students. But the flight approach can be incorporated at all levels of uh, language education and with different languages. At the end, um, I'll go over some brief um, some resources for instructors that they can access um, on the flight website to be able to develop their own lessons, download lessons, and rework them for their own class. Okay. So, what is flight? As uh, Kate also mentioned, flight is an acronym for a foreign language and the literary in the everyday, and it was developed by Joanna Lux from Cornell University, and she published a book with uh, funding from CORAL, the language, uh, the resource center at, at the University of Texas at Austin, and her book, The Literary in the Everyday, and the teacher's guide that is accessible online provide the framework for this, this approach. So Joanna developed this approach to address two main challenges in foreign language teaching. One of the first challenges is the language and literature divide. Oftentimes in language learning curriculum, there is a divide between the language classes, those, those skills needed to learn grammar and vocabulary, and then of course the analytical skill, skills of more advanced classes um, and literature and culture classes. This often creates difficulties when learners have to shift to using more analytical skills, as Kate has mentioned in, in some of her, in her work, and, and when moving on from lower to more advanced classes. Um, the 2007 MLA report mentioned this divide and talked about uh, replacing this, this um, dichotomous system with a more continuous, cohesive curriculum that incorporates the language, culture, and literature at all stages so that students can develop those skills necessary for language learning and language use at all stages. So that is one of the uh, challenges that this, this framework hopes to address. Um, Multi-literacies approaches in general and text-based approaches have been very effective in, in um, bridging this gap, and flight falls under this umbrella of a multi-literacy text-based approach, and we'll talk about what that means um, specifically in terms of the lesson. A second challenge to foreign language teaching is the way that language is often perceived or understood. For example, in many grammar textbooks, uh, students see grammar laid out as a, as a rule-based system focused on form and focusing on um, how that, a meaning tied to a specific uh, use, but one sole meaning, static meaning. Um, and, the, and the exceptions to rules are often footnotes or little blurbs, um, and not much attention is paid to those. But we know that this does not entirely cover the, how we make meaning in language. 
And Joanna Lux um, tells a, a joke often to illustrate this point, so I'm going to relay um, one of her best jokes. Um, <laughs> the, so one day, a linguistics professor was lecturing his students and, and says to the students, in English, two negatives form a positive, and in other languages, like Russian, two negatives remain negative. However, there is no language in which two positives form a negative. And a student in the back of the classroom says, yeah, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> this joke and all this to say that rules don't add up to how we actually make meaning out of language. And so that is what the flight approach attempts to address. And it takes into account the plasticity of language, how language is extended and used and moving away from a rule-based form-focused perspective of language into a focus on meaning and how we make meaning with language. So components of this um, to address these, these challenges include the literary and the everyday. And so what do we mean by the literary? In the flight approach, the literary is conceived of as the plasticity of language. That is how we subvert language, how we conceptualize it, how language is extended, the multiple layers of meaning that single words or complex structures um, or protracted discourse can convey. So that is what is referenced in the literary portion of this framework. Another aspect of this is language as culture. The resonances of meaning tie to tie language to the mental imagery of the speaker or writer. That is the imagery shaped by personal experience in the physical and cultural context that constitute the world of the individual. As such, the literary is also emblematic of language as culture. So these form a cohesive whole in this framework. And this is also connected to understanding the, ev the everyday, which Marcelo will talk about. Mm -hmm. So the everyday, of course, refers to written, spoken, and visual language used for everyday communication. Uh, the important thing here is that we're understanding the everyday language uh, as something that has an intimate connection to the literary. Because, uh, as Joanna Lux explains, languages are metaphorically structured. Uh, language evolves a core set of prototypes for words, grammatical functions, syntactic, sy syntactic structures, and sounds. These prototypes are then available for generating further meanings and uses through processes of, ex of extension. Within this frame, the term metaphor is used in its broadest sense to encompass any and all of the ways in which meanings can be extended from the primary to the secondary and beyond. Therefore, not only, the metaphorical, uh, not only must the metaphorical be integrated from the beginning, but it can be accomplished through the language of the everyday. Uh, therefore, in, in the flight approach, we are understanding that the literary is embedded in everyday language itself. It's not something separate and far from it. From it. Uh, because we're understanding everyday language as a system that is essentially creative and playful because it's always generating new and unexpected meanings, actually. We generate new meanings uh, the, um, through these different ways, which in the fly approach we call the categories of the literary. We generate new meanings uh, through playing or subverting sounds, uh, images, words, grammar structures, genres, interactional modes, perspectives, symbols, and cultural practices and products. Here, we see these as distinct categories, but normally in real communicative situations and texts, they tend to superpose and act together, as we're going to see immediately in some examples. For example, here uh, we have a material used for a lesson in German created by Chantal Warner. The lesson title is Cultural Illusion, Humor, and Memes on and Offline. And here she's using uh, this picture where you have, uh, at a German university, a broken door or a sign that says, broken, the technician has been informed. 
and somebody added as a joke another sign that says the technician is also broken. <laughs> and for some reason, I don't know why, suppose German humor, people started adding and adding memes with references to this, you know, as you can see, with references to movies, one does not simply inform the technica or to cartoons, is this the technica? No, this is Patrick, uh, TV programs, etc. So you can see in this image alone, this is part of a lesson, but I'm concentrating in just this image. You have, for example, visual play. You have play with the formatting, because memes, of course, have a very specific, a specific format that you play with. You have word play, you have puns. You have uh, genre play, because, of course, memes is a kind of uh, literary genre. And you have a uh, playing with a uh, multilingualism, code switching, uh, as you can see in some of the examples I already showed. Um, I, there is the, this play with German and English, and also with some um, uh, with interaction between German culture and globalized culture of mass media. Or, for example, this is another uh, material material used for a lesson entitled Cosas de Ciudad in Spanish created by Natasha Cesar Suarez. And these are a list of slogans used by the 15F movement, a Spanish social and political movement also known as the anti-austerity movement or the indignados. Uh, and in these slogans you can find again a lot of different kinds of categories of the literary. You have rhyming, uh, tu pasividad es tu complicidad. You have wordplay with puns. For example, here in this connection between Obama's campaign slogan and the activity, a typical activity of this movement that it was camping in squares in the city. Yes, we camp. Um, you have non-standard grammar, just like in poetry. You have metaphors turn off the TV, turn on your mind. And you have, again, the playing with the language and cultures you know, between Spain and uh, a globalized, uh, Americanized culture. So now that we've seen these concepts of literary in the everyday, and we see the literary in, in this, this everyday text, um, we're going to be talking about this in terms of our lesson plans and how we've addressed this. Um, and so to understand that, um, we're going to go over quick the framework of these lessons. And the framework of the flight lesson is based on a multiliteracies framework for collegiate foreign language teaching, which hopefully we all know, um, and was dealt, dealt by Paisani, Willis, Ellen, and Dupuy. And it includes four pedagogical acts of meaning design, including uh, the situated practice or experiencing, where the learners reflect on familiar experiences and observe something that is unfamiliar. Uh, the second stage is the overt instruction, um, where they conceptualize the, the actual language use and conventions, explicit learning, um, and then there's explicit learning related to these language, this language use and conventions. And then critical framing, so analyzing the text functionally and critically. And transformed practice, applying what you know, applying all this information and being able to produce language in new and creative ways. Um, and something that I should, should have mentioned is that when we talk about text, we're talking about um, text in a broad sense, including memes, including those, those slogans that we've seen. So um, my lesson that I developed is actually thank, thanks to Sarah Mack, who is also here today. Um, and it was based on this, this uh, desire to change some of the, the focus in the intermediate Spanish language course. Um, and I talked with Sarah about some of the needs in the class, and she said that she was interested in this topic of globalization of food. And so that's the title of my lesson, is Globalization of Food. Um, a lot of times in flight lessons, the, the pictures are accompanying the lessons to help situate the, um, the students. Um, so this lesson that I developed with the help of Sarah and, and Mandy Mankey is focused on, on this topic. And in my lesson, the different play that uh, I'll be focusing on are grammar play, symbolic play, and culture play. And we'll see what that means in a second. We'll look at the text. 
The grammar focus includes past participles as adjectives uh, in Spanish uh, and metaphor. These are two things that students don't necessarily, uh, are they aren't necessarily exposed to at the intermediate level. Metaphor, we don't necessarily think of metaphor as something that can be taught as, you know, as in an, in an understanding of grammar, so, but we'll see in a moment um, what that looks like. So this is quite a complex topic, um, but we can see how it's broken down in the main objectives of the course. So we're looking at this text because it, it can help us understand the long lasting impact of food production in Latin America. The economic and political development of several, which is the economic and political development of several Latin American countries. Throughout this lesson, uh, students are able to interpret and question the ideological perspectives of the exportation of fruit and its impact on Latin America by identifying and analyzing descriptive language. So that is looking at metaphor and looking at how these past participles are used as adjectives. Students will then be able to utilize their descri that descriptive language in their own writing. So being able to uh, mobilize that information for their own purposes. So first we, we're, you know, if you remember this, this framework, the multiliteracies uh, framework, we start with situated practice. And so that's where I started with this, um, with this lesson. So in the introduction of the lesson, I situate students within the familiar. What are their uh, favorite foods? How does the food get to their table? Where does your, where does your food come from? Thinking about, do you drink coffee every morning? Where does coffee come from? Right, situating with what we know before entering into the unfamiliar. Right? And of course, situating the text within that. Uh, before reading, we read the title, La United Fruit Company, <coughs> apologize. It's a little bit different here than uh, what showed up on the computer. Um, and what do we think it means? So making predictions on, the, on this text based on the title, La United Fruit Company, um, what do you think that, that means? Okay. So looking specifically at the, at the text, I just have the first um, part of the text here, which is a poem by Pablo Neruda, La United Fruit Company. And so if you see the, as you see the title now, um, you may think your students may be able to, to make predictions about what that actually means. The co is usually referencing company in English, so we can make predictions about what we might see in the text. So the different, different plays that I mentioned earlier, we see play out in this first part of the poem. Um, in the first, first part, estuvo todo preparado is an example of grammar play. Preparado is a past participle, which often students learn in uh, copula constructions, but here we're seeing it as an adjective. Um, so that's an example of grammar play. We also see symbolic play. Se reservó lo más jugoso. They reserved the juiciest part, the juicy part. A la dulce cintura de América, the sweet waist. So saying juicy and sweet in conjunction with this information that we know about fruit, right? It's, it, we see metaphorical language use, okay? The descriptive words that are used in the text also convey different uh, perspectives on, on this uh, experience. So we see, again, also culture play. The, so it, it would mean something completely different if the author said, um, decided to use bitter, for example, um, or something that's not related to, to flavor. It would mean something different than if we had this here as, as juicy or sweet. So we see then culture play. So after we've gone through some of this, um, the students will then identify these descriptive words and think about the effect that these words have on the meaning, right? Um, then there's a brief moment where we go over some instruction on past participles as adjectives. So there's a, some explicit instruction and metaphors as well. Students then are, um, go into analysis. What do you think the author's opinion is on this topic? What evidence supports this conclusion? So thinking about how the, the different, the descriptive words can lead us to make predictions about what we think the author, what author is trying to convey in this text. And also the purpose of the text. Why did the author write this poem as opposed to something else? And also about this topic. Why did he write about this topic? Um, I should mention also, this is kind of a boiled down version of the lesson. If you'd like to see a more detailed 
version. Um, I'll just point to that at the end where you can find these lessons. And then at the end, transformed practice. So we think about the genre that we're looking at. We're looking at poetry. We think about the, the topic that we're looking into. We're looking into globalization of food. So we can start with a food maybe that's very uh, important in Minnesota. What's a food that's important in Minnesota? I can think milk in Wisconsin cheese, thinking of, of, of those and being able to then extrapolate into um, the uh, thinking of globalization of food and food production, right? And thinking about that in conjunction with, with poetry, how can we describe that with the language that we know in Spanish? So then we would go into a, uh, to a stage of preparation where we think about incorporating metaphor in our own practice, in our own writing, in this poem, for example, that they will write, and of course, past participles as ad adjectives. And then the first draft and revisions. So this lesson is intended to uh, take as, as long as it needs to in the class. It could be one day, it could be two days, but it's also intended to situate itself within um, a lesson possibly or a, or a chapter on food where you can then expand into this more complex topic that you can combine the language, culture, and, and literary in, your, in this lesson. So we'll see another example from Marcelo. Well, in my case, the um, lesson I prepared uh, using the flight approach is entitled Una Carta para Dios, a letter for God. And it's a lesson that uses as its main material uh, a letter found in this church in Dalcahue, that is a little town in the archipelago of Chiloé in the south of Chile. Uh, this is a lesson that requires, sorry, <coughs> L let's see this first. Uh, this lesson has uh, several kinds of literary play, play, culture play, genre play, and um, perspective play. The grammar focuses mainly on subjunctive, and the main objectives are to interpret and an analyze an expression of popular religiosity in Latin American culture, to compare it with the students on cultural context, and to formulate requests using subjunctive and the epistolary genre, the genre of letters. So, as I was saying, the, this lesson requires a lot of cultural contextualization. But because obviously I don't want to start giving a lecture on the culture of the Chilo archipelago or Chile or anything like that, what I normally do is to use a lot of pictures like these ones. I have many more to use. So showing pictures of the place, for example, or the interior of some churches in Chiloé, I ask the students questions, for example, uh, what do you think most of people in this town do for a living? Or do you notice the main material in the buildings, the boats, the church, you know? Why do you think they only use wood practically for everything? Or why do you think people leave pictures and notes and plagues and uh, flowers to the statue of Christ? So, uh, through what the students normally uh, think about it, they can imagine things, you know, I expand on some of their ideas, and basically in 10 minutes we arrive to a lot of conclusions. For example, that this is a really isolated place. That's the reason why they use wood for practically everything, because it's the only native material in these islands. Um, uh, for example, that most of these people are fishermen or sailors, um, people who live in a very intimate connection to the sea. They even have adapted their houses, you know, for the tides of the sea. And in regard to religiosity, they seem to have a very intimate connection to their Catholic faith. Uh, as you can see here, when people leave their own pictures, so pictures of, the, of their kids or uh, notes in thanking God or the Virgin for favors received. And then, after that contextualization, I can tell them the story of the letter. As I said before, this letter, uh, I found it in this church in Dalcahue. Um, and attached to the church, there is this little room that, well, it's called a museum, but actually it's just a little room with like three objects. And one of those objects, it was this wooden ship where people left uh, letters for God. 
And of course, I didn't want to uh, start looking for a letter there, you know. But I just took a quick picture of the letter that was in, on top. And I struck gold because it's a very interesting text. Uh, you have there a literal transcription where you can see, for example, that there is no punctuation at all. There is only one accent mark in the name, Ramon. Um, and there are some very strange things. For example, por favor should be two words, but it's connected. And a very approximate translation is, dear God, please make Ramon fall in love with me and make him ask me to be his girlfriend this Friday when the school year ends. And let both of us pass, please. I believe in you and have faith in you. By dear God, I love you very much. <laughs> so when I present this material to my students normally, they are uh, surprised by, uh, by, by a lot of things. One thing, for example, they always pay attention to is that even when the writing uh, seems to reveal a, reveal a person that is not highly educated, um, it's a very non-standard uh, idiosyncratic writing, she totally nailed the subjunctive. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can have, you have there, you know, examples of sub subjunctive not only for requests, petitions, for example, que Ramon se enamore de mí y me pida y que pase de curso, but you also have eh, cuando sea la licenciatura, subjunctive to indicate an ante anticipated situation, you know, that is normally a kind of subjunctive that is really hard for learners of Spanish. And the other thing, of course, that is really striking here is the use of the diminutive. That even when in Chile we abuse a lot of the diminutive, that is very <laughs> characteristic of Chile, you know, even in, in other countries of Latin America, they tend to talk about the Chilenitos, the little Chileans, you know, to make fun of us. But even in that context of Chilean culture, this Diosito is really striking, you know, like dear little God. It indicates a level of intimacy that is very special. It's like you would talk to a real father or mother you adore, like mamita, mommy, papi. So after uh, we do the cultural contextualization, after we read and comment the letter, basically the lesson is divided in two parts, one part of interpretation and analysis where the students first, for example, discuss what does the author value, you know? Or what is the relationship like between the author of the letter and her addressee? How does that make you feel? That actually is a question that I, I had not considered when I first designed this lesson, but later I realized that it was really important because that relation of intimacy with God for some students is really cute and beautiful and then I realized that for some other students it can be a little bit like disrespectful or a, bit, a little bit uncomfortable. Um, or what can we infer, infer about the author's age, her educational level, or any other information? And normally students have a lot of ideas about that. And finally, uh, an activity of writing your own letter. I want to uh, emphasize that even when this is a very classical activity in all languages classes, you know, you always have to write a letter to somebody. But I want you to notice how when you incorporate this uh, in the flight approach, suddenly it's just not a, any writing exercise. It has a cultural value and it has a lot of things you can analyze and, and discuss about. So this is an activity that has several steps. First, in a small groups, uh, students discuss if you could find a similar letter in a church in the U.S. If you did, what would be different? Or how and to whom do Americans express their needs and wishes? So we normally students start discussing if we're in a more secular, more religious society, etc. Then, as individual work, the students write their own letters about their wishes to God or to somebody else. And they, along of expressing their petitions, they have to explain why those things are important to them. 
what is the value attached to those desires. Then in pairs, they exchange letters. They write comments about how that letter make them feel, what questions would, would they like to ask to the person who wrote the letter. And finally, some of them can share the letters with the rest of the class. And we, uh, as a, an entire group, uh, analyze how this letter compares in content and form to the one from Chile. So um, now we've given you a brief overview of some of the framework and the lessons. I'm going to share with you some links to different resources. Um, the first is flite.org. Um, and you can go to this website to find lessons that you can modify for your class or figure out how to um, develop a, a flight lesson yourself and have that published. Um, one aspect of the flight approach is that it's an open educational resource, and so that means you can go in and modify it um, as long as you attribute to, um, to the author that you made in, in your lesson. So this, the web page looks like this once you um, log in. And you can see there, there's a information about the flight approach, example lesson, uh, lessons. And if you go to specifically the how to tab and all the way to the bottom, um, click on flight resources and it will take you to a page with the teacher guide uh, written by Jenna and well, as well as uh, PowerPoints and webinars from the previous workshops that they've, that they've done. And of course, uh, the CORAL website that you can access get information about, about their, the center and, of course, information about those open educational resources. So uh, with that, before, before we end for questions, I wanted to shout out to uh, some of our people here as well as people that have supported us in this experience. So Mandy Menke and Sarah Mack for helping us develop these lessons and also putting this opportunity on our radar. Um, and also to Carl Blythe and the Coral team for uh, hosting us and um, helping us learn more about open um, educational resources. And of course, Joanna Lux and uh, Chantel Warner, who um, developed this, this framework and have been uh, providing feedback and information about it. And of course, Carla, thank you for inviting us and having us here. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, something that um, I found very appealing about the flight approach is that it actually addressed something that I kind of instinctively had noticed over the years, and is that especially with the uh, beginner's level, uh, when you exclude so much of the culture and so much of the non-standard language, classes are really boring, you know? So I instantly, you know, and I'm sure a lot of you do the same thing. You tend to incorporate, even in a beginner's class, you know, some graffiti, some memes, some other stuff to make it more fun, you know. And for some people, it seems it's a problem, you know, that all these kind of deviations from the norm because you have to give a lot of explanation, etc. You know, but that's exactly what language is about. Mm -hmm. And I would also add that. Um, well, I haven't had the opportunity to Im implement this exact lesson. Stay tuned, that will be this semester. <laughs> um, but I have incorporated the flight approach in it and developed other lessons that I have done. And what I've noticed is that students feel much more engaged because they're, they are college students. They, they have all of this, they're talking about intense topics and subjects and concepts in the, you know, outside of the Spanish class. And we can bring those topics into our language classes. And they, they have the, the wherewithal and the capability to do that. And so combining that with language learning, they, I think they, um, they feel more, they have more agency, I think, in there. And they're more excited to participate, I think, because they, it's, it's, it isn't just, OK, here's the verb conjugations. Or it's, it's, it's not just, OK, talk about what you did last weekend um, in the past tense. So. Yeah. Do you think some of that engagement comes from your personal engagement in developing the materials because you're invested in what you're teaching because mm -hmm. you selected the text? Do you think that that brings an additional element of engagement to the students because you're excited mm -hmm. about teaching these things? 
Yes. I mean, I, I think it, I think I think excitement is, always has a place in the language classroom. I think it's great. Um, I will I will say if I've I have incorporated this in texts that I haven't necessarily chosen and haven't necessarily they haven't been my favorite texts. And even still, because because it is just a different way of, of pulling out you know information and looking at it and, and you're actually able to analyze it, I still get excited about it, even if it is a text that I didn't choose. Um, but text selection is a whole different subject. That's a whole different thing, a uh, different uh, workshop and, and talk. But I think that's a main, a big part of this too, is, is understanding that, um, thinking about the text in those different ways. My text, you know, someone, I had a comment, it's like, how can you pick this text for intermediate learners? That seems like a very difficult text. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and so thinking about how you can make a text actually work for different levels. Um, so thinking about text selection is also something that I try to keep in mind. Yes? I'm curious, um, when you teach the lessons, are, they, are the students explicitly aware of the different categories that you showed us in terms of like symbolic play, metaphorical play? Do, do they know that they're working within these categories? Well, in my case, no, no, no. definitely not. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say, I don't think that I, do, I don't make that like clear, I make it clear the objectives of, you know, those are the, the objectives that we do that I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, that's how I sort of frame it. Um, and we understand, of course, there's an instruction later on with the, with the specific grammar pieces that we see. So this is the past participle as adjective. Uh, this is a metaphor, and we understand what that means explicitly, but we don't, um, at least in my experience, I haven't explicitly said, this is grammar play, this is literary play, but, but we do see um, because it doesn't, I, I don't think that that would add too much for them. They, we already go through that understanding of how that creates a distinct meaning um, on its own. I don't think, if I were to say to my students, this is grammar play, I mean, we've already seen it. They don't have to have actually a name for it. I think the importance of the categories is giving you ideas about how to approach materials in different mm -hmm. ways. Because, for example, I had never heard, I mean, even with my material, to think about the perspective play. Mm -hmm. You know, that it, kind of like some of these categories, when you see it, you know, you analyze your material, you analyze your lesson, and if you check the categories, you can realize, oh, yeah, I could use that too. You know, and you're constantly finding more and more things that you could take advantage of. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you may, with your students, highlight the fact, okay, look, we're seeing different perspectives and how they're being played with, but I don't necessarily... I don't know if it would be beneficial to specifically use the language and say, look, this is perspective play. You might do it in a more, in a different way. The reason I asked was just say, and I agree maybe not using yeah. exact terms, but it could give the students a really powerful tool for agency, but exactly. then when they start yeah. to read text on their own, mm -hmm. they can name things that they see in the text yeah. without needing the teacher to be thinking about it, right? If they exactly. already have these terms. Metaphor is a, a common one, right? I think they yeah. have metaphors in high school. Mm -hmm. But some of those other terms that they yeah. can start naming things yeah. themselves, that could be a yeah, powerful tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any work where you start with the text in English that has the play, and then go to the target language? Do you know what I mean? Where they see, mm -hmm. where they analyze mm -hmm. in their mm -hmm. native language the same kind of play that we want them to pull mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. the um, target language text. Just curious if there's anything on that. I there. haven't seen it, but I, you could always look at the example lessons mm -hmm. on the website and see. You don't believe so. Because that's something but, that maybe yeah. like with the on, with online platforms, you mm -hmm. can have them do that online outside of class to kind of build that knowledge in the L1. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily need to know how to say it in the target language, but then they have those constructs yeah. when they start looking at the target language text. Mm -hmm. um, how have you been talking about how you would assess the effectiveness of these lessons, either formally or informally? Like in terms of the, the student learning outcomes or new ways of, I mean, how do you assess if this is something that's a successful model for your classrooms? Have you talked about that at all? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested. You wanna? <laughs> okay, I can start. Well, first, I mean, they, at the, you're talking, are you talking about this less, like these lessons in particular? Right. Because I think you know one of the, the hard realities we always come up against, which most of us do not uh, relish, or mm -hmm. right, it's not something we like, but the reality of the students, right, they make the connection to what I'm doing in class and what my grade is going to be made up exactly. of. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And again, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have that tension. Right. right. So right. Do, do you have any thoughts about how to negotiate yeah. that? So, um, 
I know I they I remember Carl and Joanna talking about this a little bit, but yeah, I do. Can but I, they do have a uh, something like mm -hmm. I mean I think I was thinking like what kind of assessment because for me for example just the simple fact that the students share their materials, you know, and the other students say what they think about it, is this effective, you know, is a kind of assessment, yeah. you know, but I understand you're referring to more like grades, I think more it's, it's quantitative. Right, right? I think that, and, I wouldn't argue with that. And you, mm. you do have a product at the end, you do have something. They have, they, have, they have written a letter, they have written a poem, or they have done some other, you know, thing um, that you can then possibly format an assessment for, right? And I think that's ultimately what my thinking was too in my lesson is that ultimately the instructor would also see these poems and be able to provide feedback on, on using these resources in this way, in this genre. Um, and I think that's a very, that's a very valid and effective tool. And I think important piece of this because that's, that's another thing if you have students produce something and then you know, it's, it's not actually being looked at or used or worked with, what is, there's, there's value in going beyond just, just producing it, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, you could look at how we write reading portions of an exam, right? Mm -hmm. That if you have done something like that where you're asking them to identify metaphor in the target language text, mm -hmm. that maybe that's going to be fair game as a question on the exam. Or maybe before it wasn't, we were more tied mm -hmm. to comprehension based questions, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Or at, at least thinking critically too about the author. Why did the author write this? What is what are the, what are the different you know are there different values that we're seeing in this um, based on the way it's written? What is your evidence? And supporting evidence is 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 important for of course backing up those claims. Yeah, there's I think there's several ways that you can incorporate assessment. Yes. So I'm wondering if during your workshop. Um, there was any discussion about how this approach works beyond introductory intermediate language courses mm -hmm. because one of the arguments in the multiliteracies literature is that this approach is something that can help graduate teaching assistants, for instance, who are getting ready to embark on a career as professors potentially. It's an approach that they can apply to any teaching that they do, essentially, that it works for language classes and it works for literature classes, it works for culture classes, yet, we often focus only on bringing text into the lower level classes as opposed to thinking about applying approaches like this to upper level classes. So my question is, mm -hmm. was there a discussion about that when you were at your workshop and is that something that you were thinking about? I mean, it's particularly relevant for you, Marcelo, because you're, you're a literature student, and so I'm wondering, yeah, as a linguist, your context is a little bit different, but I'm just kind of wondering your thoughts about that or what the experience was with your workshop. Well, actually, I always had the impression that it's like, like the opposite, you know, like mm -hmm. the challenge is actually bringing like the literary aspects to the beginner's levels, mm -hmm. because at least in literature, you know, even in the most advanced levels, even in a graduate class, you're always discussing about the form, the grammar, the vocabulary selection and stuff like that, you know. At least that was the discussion of the workshop, because there, was a, there were a lot of uh, high school instructors there. Um, and so that was the discussion that we were involved in. Perhaps it would be a little bit different depending on the makeup of the audience. But I have thought about this uh, this as well. And and um, a lot of these a lot of these tools do kind of stem from from these more analytical skills that are more that have been more easily incorpor incorporated in these literature courses, mm -hmm. like the ones you're teaching right now. Um, and I can you know I'm I'm teaching uh, introduction to linguistics in Spanish right now. And I think this this kind of, and I'm bringing in this kind of thing in my in my classes as well, and it makes the things that you're learning about more real for the students. And I think so. I, it doesn't seem like a big jump to incorporate it. Is what I'm saying. I, I feel like it's very mm -hmm. natural to sort of incorporate these these um, uh, this framework within within higher level cl classes. So it'd be interesting to do more thinking on that. Yeah. Actually, for example, uh, for an advanced level, that connection in my lesson between the diminutive or the subjunctive, mm -hmm. you know, and all the cultural aspects, is something that it just in an uh, advanced class, uh, like, appears naturally, you know, when we're talking about uh, material. Uh, the challenge for me when designing, when designing this lesson was thinking precisely, how do I do something similar with people who are not 
in an advanced level. You know, how do I mm -hmm. simplify this in a way that it can be accessible yeah. for people, for example, in an in intermediate level? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I don't mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but what we know from the PACE project is that students in those advanced level classes don't have advanced level proficiency. Yeah. So yeah. what are we doing mm -hmm. to attend to their language development through engagement with text in mm -hmm. this kind of an approach? That's kind of what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't expect you to have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is a very good question. But at the same yeah. time, for example, very in an advanced class, you can see that an activity like that, for example, makes you use subjunctive again and write a letter like you did three years ago, but it doesn't make you feel that dumb, you know? Yeah. Because at least you're producing this simple text, you know, with simple structures in a culturally significant uh, context, you know? I think what you're pointing out is what's key is that being explicit about saying, okay, this is subjunctive, in the advanced class, exactly. this is mm -hmm. subjunctive, and talk about it in a more sophisticated way than you oh, might yeah. in the lower level class, right? So sort of yes. cycling exactly. it, recycling that kind of stuff yes. through yes. engagement with the text. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's a really, that's a good also point to bring up too, is that there is a role for this explicit instruction of these specific grammar features and these features of language. Um, and it's and it's valid in this in this sort of framework, which I think um, is something that, especially with with the type of grammar things that we looked in my lesson with metaphor, is not necessarily easy to sort of describe and work with in more of a communicative language teaching way. It'd be a little more difficult. Um, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> one more question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So kind of related to her question. Kate's question, um, it, but bringing in modality into the mix, because mm -hmm. that's another thing that as we look at learners, right, the, even among our people and our like, listening skills are mm -hmm. traditionally the lowest. Mm -hmm. And I think right, what is lovely about the visual is that people who, have, who are sighted at least, right, mm -hmm. are able to access that easily. In the workshop, did they like, take on the whole idea of listening? in terms of this and the, the different challenges it presents at the intermediate and the advanced level. So this, like uh, audio text mm -hmm. and how to attend to building listening skills in the same way that we're building either skills in writing or in speaking. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like so having an audio text yeah. as your base. How does that change things? I mean, it's a... I do not think we touch on that very uh, explicitly, but I think there was a couple of years ago. <laughs> to clarify that. <laughs> no, I went back. I went back and watched all the all the stuff too, oh, to yes, make sure. But um, I did. I went back and watched all of it and realized I was on video there too. <laughs> but um, I do not remember specifically. But I do remember talking about social reading. So I'm wondering if there's a way. If they if if that might be a way to go with with sort of listening is because social reading. Um, you know, you had this text and students were able to then go make comments and sort of um, annotate it in their, in their way to make sense of the text. And they wonder if there's something similar that, that might be beneficial for, for listening in that, um, to develop those skills. Is it similar to social reading, so social listening, I don't know if that's Well, in some of the thing, social reading programs, you can add also, you can also voice add comments. audio, but that's different than if you're analyzing an, an audio text like a like a yeah. you know, oral as in listening mm -hmm. so but i wonder if that's a way but i but it's still i would still consider it a text right there's still um there's still you can still pull I out mean, some of these if you're listening to the meeting. comments of your classmates and right. comment on them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how do you map the multiliteracy approach onto that system? yeah i think and i think you can you can absolutely you know take use a use a um listening text and if I get back to that, um, as we've seen before, I think Katie has some examples in, in and they have some of the examples in the book, and developing these, these um, using the listening text and developing some of these different, different acts, right, mm -hmm. throughout the lesson. I think it's, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Other I think one of the challenges too with the listening, because I know with the IPAs, there aren't a lot of IPAs that have a listening text as their text, right? Mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder, I mean, just from teaching ESL and having to really listen to something in English and try to capture everything, it's a lot of work. I mean, we mm -hmm. take it for granted, like, yeah, I understood that. But if you were trying to teach a, a listening text to students, 
at least for me in my L1, I have to go in there and listen again and again, mm -hmm. and I'm taking notes. So it's just so time consuming to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There are different, and if you don't have to necessarily focus on the whole text. Like, like we've seen in these poems and, and these, these other texts, like we don't focus on everything that there is there. You know, and, and that's maybe where the answering the, the portion about um, more advanced is you, you pay attention to more things than within that text, right? Um, like the cognitive load for the student exactly. on the length yeah. and the, de uh, the density of it. So yes. these other things kind of fall away. Yeah, they so just you wanna, only focus on one thing yeah. and you sort of add onto it, like when you're talking about recycling these, these texts and adding on, focusing on more. Um, Yeah. 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 I, I just have one question. <laughs> I'm dying to ask. It's not really a question, but it's a comment, and yeah. I just wonder about your thoughts. So yeah. I really appreciated your explanation of the literary and the everyday in this approach. I have found that a little opaque in the approach, mm -hmm. so it was very clear what you guys did. But it made me wonder when we're defining language, literary, the literary in this way, can't we say that anything is a literary text? What is this? What are the implications for which say, everything yeah. is a literary text? How do we define what literature is? <laughs> that was actually you uh, yes. You know, no, but that's kind if of what I we remember too, correctly, yeah. I think yeah. I asked that question during yes, the workshop in yes, one moment. Did. You know, yeah. because of course, because I come from literary studies. You know, my definition of what is literary was quite different. Yeah. Uh, I would agree in principle with you, you know, and I don't think that's a problem. I think that's an advantage yeah, I agree. because actually if you see like any kind of um, any kind of thing really, you know, like mm -hmm. images, uh, mm -hmm. language text, visual text, whatever, you know, uh, as a literary text, uh, that means that it's an invitation to analyze. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great for a language class. You know, and I think it's what a lot of us do in our class all mm -hmm. the time. I mean, it doesn't matter if we're watching a video on YouTube or we're listening to a song or we're doing anything, we're analyzing. And I think this is an approach that uh, fosters your abilities and the abilities of your students to precisely pay attention to the visual aspect, to the perspective aspect, to the grammar aspects, you know, pay attention to everything. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. And I think what's really, I mean, what I like about this idea of plasticity of language and metaphor and play is that it, it, it describes what literary, what is literary in a way that's very different from the way that we typically describe literature, mm -hmm. which is, what other people perceive as valuable and something that's a, a pristine example of language use mm -hmm. or whatever we define the canon, mm -hmm. right? And this mm -hmm. expands that so much, mm -hmm. but still focuses on the linguistic features of a yeah. text that make it literary. Mm -hmm. And what I really appreciate too about, and, and I think Joanna mentioned this several times, the word play is very intentional. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, I think it's fun. My students usually think it's fun. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Thank you.